This module will provide an introduction to the basic principles of evaluating trabecular bone on intraoral radiographs. In addition to evaluating the teeth and periodontal structures on intraoral images, we also evaluate the trabecular bone. We assess the quality of trabecular bone in terms of its radio density and the quantity of trabecular bone in terms of the number of bony trabeculae that can be seen. At first glance, you will note that there are certain areas within these images that appear relatively radiolucent. These areas are anatomic radiolucencies and can be considered in three broad groups. Bone concavities, air cavities, and neurovascular bundles on canals. Now let's review those anatomic radiolucencies in more detail. The first one is the lateral fossa. This is located in the maxilla, in the region of the maxillary lateral incisor. As you will note from the CT scan, there is a depression or a concavity on the buccal surface and that results in a decreased thickness of bone, making the bone around the lateral incisor look relatively more radiolucent. The radiolucency is diffuse in nature and you can continue to appreciate a trabecular pattern through the area that is radiolucent. Most importantly, you will note that the lamina dura that surrounds the teeth is intact. This indicates that there is no apical periodontal inflammation. Thus, by ruling out disease, you establish normalcy of that radiolucent area. A similar phenomenon also occurs in the mandibular anterior region. The buccal bone adjacent to the mandibular incisors is thin. Note that the mandible is relatively narrower in the region adjacent to the teeth. As a result, this area adjacent to the mandibular incisors appears relatively radiolucent on periapical radiographs. Again, you will note that the lamina dura and periodontal ligament space that surrounds the mandibular incisors is intact and this helps you rule out apical periodontal inflammation and establish that this is an anatomic radiolucency. Similarly, the submandibular fossa is a bony concavity located in the posterior mandible. This region projects as a radiolucency apical to the mandibular molar roots. Due to its extent and its often marked appearance, it may be mistaken for pathology. The next group of anatomic radiolucencies are the air cavities, the nasal cavity and the maxillary sinus. The radiolucent air space of the nasal cavity is often projected over the maxillary incisor roots and can be mistaken as pathology. Likewise, remember that there is considerable variation in the anatomy of the maxillary sinus which can have an undulating inferior border that extends between the roots of the teeth. Also consider that pathologies of the maxillary sinus appear as radiopaque within the air cavity and can mask the radiolucency of the air sinus. The third category of anatomic radiolucencies are the neurovascular canals and foramina and these are easily identified based on their characteristic location. In the posterior mandible, identify the mandibular canal and the mental foramina bilaterally. The mental foramina are typically located between the roots of the premolars. Often, the image of the mental foramen is superimposed over the root apex of a premolar. In this case, it's important to distinguish it from apical periodontal disease. An intact lamina dura and pedial space around the root apices will indicate absence of apical periodontal pathology and indicate that the superimposed radiolucency is an anatomic radiolucency. The images of the nasopalatine canal and incisor foramen are projected in the anterior maxilla in the midline. Note that there is considerable variation in the size of the incisor foramen and often Similar to the mental foramen, it is superimposed over the roots of the adjacent teeth and can be mistaken as apical periodontal pathology. The presence of an intact lamina dura and periodontal ligament space around the incisor roots will establish that the superimposed radiolucency is anatomic in nature. In the anterior mandible, you may note the opening of the lingual foramen projected between the incisor roots. Due to its small size, it may not be seen and it's typically not confused with pathology. So to summarize, an easy way to identify those normal anatomic radiolucencies, remember the characteristic location. Remember that these radiolucencies will appear symmetric, 
So comparing the images of the right and the left side allows you to make assessments whether radiolucency is anatomic or pathologic in nature. And finally, when these radiolucencies are superimposed with the teeth, make sure that you identify an intact laminar dura and PDL space. This will help you rule out any apical pathology and any odontogenic cause for a radiolucency. That information is necessary for you to make the decision that the superimposed radiolucency is indeed anatomic in nature. So before we start to analyze the radiological appearances of bone, let's quickly review the structure of bone. The outer surface of bone is made up of compact bone or cortical bone. This is highly mineralized and thus appears markedly radiopaque. The cortical bone encloses trabecular bone which houses the bone marrow. The trabecular bone or cancellous bone is comprised of a network of intersecting bony plates or trabeculae which appear radiopaque. The intervening radiolucent spaces are occupied by bone marrow tissue. There is considerable variability in the radiographic appearance of the trabecular bone, both in terms of its radio density and in its trabecular architecture. Some of this variability is dependent on the age and race of the patient. The trabecular pattern also varies between anatomic sites and as you will note between the maxilla and the mandible. Perhaps most importantly in the jaws, there are local factors that could induce local variations in the trabecular pattern. These include missing teeth, tooth migration and jaw forces. Now let's start to analyze the trabecular pattern on the FMX. To facilitate our discussion, here are selected radiographs from different areas of the maxilla and mandible. These radiographs demonstrate the variation in the trabecular pattern between different areas in the jaw. The trabecular pattern in the maxilla is relatively uniform through both the anterior and the posterior regions. The trabeculae are thin and form a criss-cross pattern with marrow spaces that are typically 1 to 3 millimeters in dimension. Characteristically, these marrow spaces are smaller than those in the mandible. For example, if you find that the marrow spaces in the maxilla are unusually large, the corresponding marrow spaces in the mandible will be larger. Localized areas of trabecular sparseness can be identified in the maxillary tuberosity or in edentulous areas. In contrast, the trabecular architecture in the mandible is quite variable to different parts of the jaw. Unlike in the maxilla, the trabeculae are thick and coarse and arranged in a horizontal pattern with little intersection. The marrow spaces in the mandible are larger than those in the maxilla. Within the mandible, the marrow spaces in the posterior mandible tend to be larger than those in the anterior mandible. Also, the horizontal arrangement of the bony trabeculation is more marked in the posterior mandible than in the anterior region of the jaw. Also note that the trabeculation in the basal body of the mandible that is the region inferior to the apices of the mandibular molars is relatively sparse. Now let's consider a practical application of this knowledge with a common clinical scenario. The trabecular pattern on our patient's radiograph appears unusual and our patient is asymptomatic. So the first question we're going to ask is, is the radiograph appropriately exposed? In other words, is this potential abnormality that we see real or is it just a function of inadequate density and contrast? And with digital intraoral imaging, you should vary the density and contrast of the image and confirm that the pattern is truly unusual. Next, review the patient's medical history. Are there any diseases that affect bone metabolism? Is the patient taking any medications that might change the trabecular pattern? Examine the region again and determine if the pattern is symmetric. A symmetric pattern is more likely to be normal than disease. If it is a patient of record, compare the current image with prior images. Are there any changes? If the appearance of the trabecular pattern is relatively stable, it's more likely to be an anatomic variation rather than disease. Finally, one of the options that we have, given that a patient is asymptomatic, is to consider re-imaging that area, typically in about 9 to 12 months, so as to assess any change. If the appearance is relatively stable over that time period, it's more likely to be an anatomic variation 
to be competent in radiological interpretation, you should have a strong appreciation of the ranges of normal appearances of trabecular patterns. To help you set your calibration scale, here are four images from different areas of the jaw, but all with a definitely normal trabecular pattern. The importance of recognizing a normal trabecular pattern is underscored by diseases that would manifest in the jaw as an abnormal trabecular pattern. Let's take the case of hyperparathyroidism, which results in increased bone turnover. As you will note from this radiograph, there's an increased hazy radiolucency of the trabecular bone with loss of its normal architecture. Additionally, you do not see any of the lamina dura around the roots of the teeth. Next, consider the radiograph from a patient with thalassemia. In this condition, there is anemia, which drives a proliferation of the bone marrow. As the bone marrow cells start to proliferate, the bone marrow spaces start to enlarge. The radiograph from the patient with thalassemia is from the anterior mandible and demonstrates, and demonstrates marrow spaces that are much larger than you would typically see in the anterior mandible. Now let's look at a periapical radiograph from a patient with fibrous dysplasia. Fibrous dysplasia is a dysplasia of bone that results in altered formation of woven-like bone locally within the jaw. Note that on the periapical radiograph, the trabecular pattern appears fine and granular with loss of the normal trabecular architecture that you would expect to see in the posterior mandible. Also note that the lamina dura surrounding these teeth is thin or missing. These three radiographs are examples of diseases that alter the trabecular pattern within the jaw. The purpose of demonstrating these radiographs here is to demonstrate to you that all of these radiographs fall on the scale of definitely abnormal and this is something that you should recognize. Note that when I described the radiological findings on the radiographs from the patients with hyperparathyroidism and fibrous dysplasia, I described the lamina dura, which is cortical bone. Remember that in addition to the lamina dura, there are several other sites of cortical bone that you evaluate when you evaluate the radiological anatomy of the maxilla and mandible. Make sure that you include assessments of these cortical bone sites along with the assessments of trabecular bone. So to summarize the learning objectives of this module, you should become familiar with the appearances of anatomical radiolucencies in the jaw as they are projected on intraoral radiographs. You should be able to recognize normal trabecular patterns within the jaw and identify factors that influence these patterns. Finally, you should be able to recognize that there are several diseases that alter the bony trabecular pattern and be able to identify bony trabecular patterns that are in the category of definitely abnormal.